Can you hear me? We're cool? Okay, if I talk, start talking too fast, uh, just yell at me, slow down. Because I will start to talk too fast. Um, so, yeah, I'm doing a platform on MongoDB. I'm kind of curious, actually, how many run MongoDB in production currently? Kind of have apps that depend on you. Not many. Um, so who am I? Um, after that long introduction there, I'm essentially, I run a company that uh, provides uh, consulting services in Toronto. Uh, we provide infrastructure for customers, um, either on-premises, um, or we provide services around infrastructure they already have in their own data centers, perhaps they have stuff in Amazon or Rackspace. Um, I, really what we do is we help customers keep sites running. That's kind of the, the breakdown of what we, what we do. We're the guys that get the calls at 11 on a Sunday night to fix things. Um, we're also a MongoDB partner uh, in Canada. I'm not sure how many there are, but probably less than 10, I'm guessing. Um, and I'm doing a talk on MongoDB, which is obviously part of the, the mean stack. Now, MongoDB is part of this larger NoSQL movement. And again, it's one of those things, you know, a label gets attached to technology. And uh, Martin Fowler wrote a great book called, called NoSQL Distilled. And I highly recommend it if you're kind of getting into the NoSQL movement. And again, it's kind of one of those very general, ill-defined set of mostly open source databases. Um, NoSQL kind of falls in line with the, the, the word cloud. It's very hard to kind of nail down what the meaning is, but generally, NoSQL means a database doesn't use SQL. Uh, generally open source and driven by need to scale and run on clusters. Um, obviously, the, I guess the, the drive for NoSQL databases came from a need to start to manage web scale applications. And the movement kind of gets, came from that. Uh, use generally no schema, and obviously because they ship away from the relational model, and there's typically kind of four NoSQL databases. Those are key value, document, column, family, and graph. So what is MongoDB? Uh, this was my first kind of uh, impression when I heard MongoDB. Uh, we provide services for customers, and we had a customer who was building a website, and they had a customer um, who was constantly changing the, the schema of the database, and it was a very short timeline to build the application. So they decided that the item-driven part of the site would actually run on something that wasn't um, MySQL-based. And they'd heard about this thing called MongoDB, and this was back in 2010. And we, they came to us and said, we have to run MongoDB, and that was pretty much my impression. Uh, we had the stack built already, and then there's this whole new thing that had to kind of come in play. And oddly enough, it's Kevin and Kevin. So that was literally my impression. Um, Mongo began in 2007 uh, by a company called TenGen, and it was initially conceived as part of a larger um, platform service. And the data store, which became MongoDB, um, was, was uh, an element of that, that larger platform initiative. They realized, I guess, at some point along the line that they had something in the actual data store itself, and they dropped the idea of the larger platform and started focusing on the database itself. And in 2009, Mongo was open sourced um, with an AGPL license. Version 1.4 was released in March 2010, and our first introduction with MongoDB was 1.6. So we were pretty far, we were pretty close to when it actually was kind of just production ready. And you can obviously download it at mongodb.org at the downloads. So this is actually a screenshot from DB Engines uh, this month, and it's now the number five uh, ranked database, DB Engines. Uh, it was and back in October, I think it was like number six, I think it leapfrogged over DB2. Uh, so it's, it's gaining momentum as far as the database option goes. So generally, MongoDB is considered a document database. Um, it's open source, high performance, uh, built for scalability, and it's full featured, and the features continue to grow as uh, versions come out. Now, when we mention document database, we don't actually mean uh, binary kind of files like PDFs and doc files. We actually kind of mean JSON documents. That's kind of what the, the document uh, name refers to. And there'll actually be a talk later on on MongoDB about kind of delve more into the, the document structure and um, kind of tying Mongo back into, into Node. Um, this talk really is just kind of a high level overview. Welcome to Mongo talk. Um, MongoDB is an open source project, um, it's on GitHub and Jira. Um, started by Tengen, uh, who is now MongoDB Inc. And you can get commercial licenses, so there are commercial offerings um, have that requirement, and contributions are always welcome. So it's written in C++, 
um, makes extensive use of memory map files. It runs nearly everywhere. You can get it for um, Linux, uh, Mac, and for Windows. Uh, data is serialized as BSON, and it supports uh, primary and secondary indexes. So this kind of gets the scale of uh, where Mongo fits in as far as depth of functionality goes and performance. Uh, the graph's not quite, I'm not sure the, I'd put RDME BMS down there at that level of scalability. Obviously, you can, you can scale, you can scale it. Um, it. There's just a, a cost, a, a cost to both financial and, and, uh, and time to kind of get it to scale. Um, but generally, out of the box, I think this is not a bad uh, overview of where Mongo sits in the, in this, in the spectrum. Uh, it has ad hoc queries, aggregation, um, geospatial features, which is kind of cool. Uh, supports most programming languages and has a very flexible schema. So just a quick touch on document, I think it's going to be touched on a little bit later on. Um, in the relational model kind of view, we have tables and views, we have collections in MongoDB. Uh, row is a document, uh, indexes are indexes, uh, joins become what are called embedded documents, and things like partitions are known as shards in, in MongoDB. So here's a kind of a general overview of a, a kind of a relational model. You have your category, articles, tags, comments, and users. And then you kind of shove that down into a schema design and you embed your uh, comments, tags, and categories into uh, what's called a document within a, within a collection. This one actually breaks it out into two, a, a user and an article. Lots of support for, uh, for drivers from, for development languages. Um, Node.js obviously being one of the larger ones. Uh, Ruby, PHP. Um, so there's lots of support for, uh, for bindings, and actually Go is not onto this list, but Go is another, uh, another good driver from MongoDB if you're into the Go language. So the drivers actually connect to the Mongo servers. Uh, if you're running MongoDB in a replica set or standalone, it talks to the MongoD process. If you're running it in a sharded environment, it talks to the Mongo West process. But from the development perspective, um, you aren't really kind of aware of that, of that communication. You, you're talking to either Mongo West or MongoD. Uh, it translates the BSON to native types. Uh, the Mongo shell is not a driver, but works like one in some ways, and I'll kind of do a, we'll do a little walk through the, the shell itself. And you'll install the drivers um, however you install your packages for the language you're, you're working with, or the framework you're working with. So running MongoDB is pretty easy. Uh, download the file, uh, untar it. Uh, it defaults into, it drops its data files into a data directory structure, and you just uh, start MongoDB and you have a Mongo process running. The Mongo shell is essentially, I guess, the equivalent of if you're in MySQL, when you kind of go into the MySQL shell to uh, run administrative commands, there's a Mongo shell equivalent to that. And you can run all your kind of your database administration, uh, your monitoring uh, functions within the shell itself, insert in the databases, view the databases, get stats, all that kind of stuff. And you can do, and because it is um, programmatic, you can actually assign values to variables. Uh, switch DBs, and you can do inserts as well. You can create the database from it as well. And what, do you, what I've got here actually, what's different from here, is I actually now have an object ID that's returned to me. And MongoDB will actually automatically create these object IDs for you. Uh, they're indexed, and, but you can actually specify your own object IDs if you want. You can override the, the default. Uh, the default object ID is a 12-byte value, and it's going to be unique across the cluster as well. Yes, you can. Um, creating a blog post, again, is fairly, fairly simple. Uh, DB is a DB reference. Article will be the uh, collection name or table name in the relational parlance. And I'm going to insert a JSON document that's got uh, a couple of values to it. And I can run a nice little find, which will display the values. And I can query it as well. So this is all within the Mongo shell. And obviously, there's also a lot of admin commands you can run as well to manage MongoDB. So you're a developer, you're building on Bean, and you want to, um, you have to run MongoDB somewhere. And you have a, a few options as far as where to run MongoDB and how to run MongoDB. The, I guess the easiest way to do it, um, to kind of get out the door, if you're a developer and not an operations guy, you can run one of the database as a service options. Um, Mongo Lab is an option. Uh, Mongo HQ is an option as well. And Object Rocket, which was just bought by Rackspace, I think, last year. So these essentially 
take away all the admin work. Um, you don't have to worry about backups. You don't have to worry about scaling out the application. Uh, you just talk to an API, and there's this magical thing that happens behind the things, and things all kind of just happen. Uh, there are lots of pros to this, and there are lots of cons to this. Um, the biggest, you know, from an operations perspective, some of the bigger cons are you, you, you do lose a lot of control. You don't have access, you don't know who has access to your data. Um, you, if you have compliance requirements, uh, keep data in Canada requirements, these are options as well. Um, so there's, you know, there's, there, you know, you get a lot for being able to kind of throw your data out there and not worry about it, but you do have to kind of worry about now where your data lives and who can see it. And, Um, it's a hard question. I think, I think, I think probably getting your feet wet with the um, how to actually query and input data into, into MongoDB that kind of stuff. I'd probably just run with one of these services here. That said, MongoDB is very easy to run off the command line, and actually kind of we'll kind of do a, a, a demo of that. The only thing is you have to guys have to worry about is, is where you make, kind of make that move from development into production. Um, I know a lot of things that kind of start out as development, getting my feet wet, end up becoming somehow production. Um, so, you know, you kind of have to kind of be wary of, of that crossover, but if, as far as just kind of wanting to get your feet wet and try touching MongoDB, probably just using this as your own, on your own, is, is the way to go. It can get expensive too, actually, as you scale out with these services. Um, they kind of get you in the door, and then if you kind of want to grow and scale, they can get very expensive very quickly. So I think to start off with just kind of, you know, you can probably just download it yourself. So the other option besides actually having someone host it for you is you hosting it yourself. Um, so the kind of the roll your own method. Now, if doing that, you now assume the responsibility of actually having to make sure things are running, that they're set up, they're backed up. Um, there's someone who can respond to issues when things happen, you have disaster recovery plans in place, all those nice things that come with actually having to manage infrastructure on your own. And there are some best practices, and again, uh, the MongoDB has a number of white papers on how to, how to kind of do best practice for MongoDB. And generally there's four kind of categories as far as best practice goes. There's initial setup and configuration, uh, the OS and file system configurations, networking and hardware recommendations. So if you're going to run your own MongoDB, um, generally in production environment you want to have three servers kind of general, as, as, as a rule uh, for production. Uh, repli replica sets are kind of the, the, the standard recommended way of running MongoDB in, in production, and replica set kind of requires, like I say, default, but it, it generally, best practice is three servers. You can get away with just two of them, um, but uh, three is kind of the way to go. 64-bit uh, versions of the OS should be used only. 32-bit um, has a limitation on the data that you can actually store in it, I think it's two gigs. So 64-bit is the way to go. Um, there are ways to actually run MongoDB from the command line, or you can actually have the data set up in configuration files. And obviously, if you're having many clusters to manage, you don't want to be having things in command lines. You want those things in configuration files. You can use like Puppet or Shaft to kind of manage your deployment. Uh, best practice is you should upgrade as often as possible. Um, I will caveat that with saying upgrade as often as possible based on feedback from the last version that you're trying to upgrade to. Um, you can, join them, you can join mailing lists, uh, you can keep an eye on JIRA. You know, the 2.4.0 release maybe isn't always the best one to kind of upgrade to until someone's actually kind of gone to 2.4.1, 2.4. Let someone else do the, the hard work of, of breaking their systems before you kind of worry about your own. So upgrade as often as possible, bearing in mind, you know, keeping an eye on where things stand as far as that version goes. Uh, and Someone has to always upgrade. Someone actually, people always do upgrade. People with very large systems actually take the initiative and upgrade. A lot of people are braver than I am. Uh, data migration. Uh, if you're coming from a relational model and you're kind of, you kind of want to move to MongoDB, uh, it's not simply a matter of just exporting your data out from relational into MongoDB. There's a bit of effort involved. Um, so don't simply just import your, your legacy dump. Uh, on the hardware side, Mongo likes RAM. Uh, the more RAM, the better. Uh, shared storage isn't a requirement. Uh, and disk access patterns are not sequential. So SSD kind of is the, the better road to go. Uh, you're probably better off putting more money into um, RAM or SSD than you are putting money into faster spinning disks. Um, 
RAID 10 is also the recommended way to go, and I think that actually applies to almost any, any, any database uh, infrastructure. And because there's not many workflows that actually utilize all the cores uh, in MongoDB, uh, generally you want to get faster clock speeds over the, the number of cores as well. So faster clock speed CPUs over, over cores and RAM and as fast disk as you can possibly get, um, SSD being the, being the preference. Uh, EHT4 and XFS are generally the recommended systems uh, setups for uh, file systems. Uh, you want to turn off A time. Um, you want to modify your U limits. Cause there's, um, and actually, there's a. We'll talk about it later later on. But when you hook up your Mongo instance into, um, uh, there's a monitoring service that Tengen or MongoDB Inc provides, um, and they'll actually kind of warn you if your U limits are too low. Um, so you can modify those as well. And disable NUMA. Uh, you can either do that in the BIOS if you have access to the, uh, the hardware, or you can do that in the uh, startup for MongoDB. Uh, networking, general networking practices, obviously. Uh, run it in a trusted environment. So if you've you got a DMZ in place, you run MongoDB behind that. Uh, and it, it binds to all available network interfaces, so make sure it just binds to the one you want it to have it, uh, it bound to. So if there's two NICs on it, and one public, one private, make sure it binds to the internal IP or internal NIC. And as I mentioned, replica sets are the way to go. Um, now, for those who don't know what a replica set is, it's essentially three MongoD instances. Uh, one is a primary, and we have two as a secondaries. Uh, so all your read writes occur to the, the primary, and the data is replicated to the, to the secondaries. Um, your application uh, actually talks to the primary. So this is where the actual driver for your, your language talks to the primary. Uh, you can have it read from secondaries. Uh, there's, a, there's a small caveat to that, but you can have, you can have it read to secondaries and um, write to primaries. So essentially, you can also have a two server option. This is what I mentioned earlier. Um, three is the recommended way to go, but you can run two uh, with an arbiter. So the arbiter would actually probably be run on an app server. Um, you still want to kind of keep three separate boxes. Uh, so you could run two boxes for your database, and then the arbiter process could run on an app server. Uh, it's very lightweight. Um, there's no data kept there. It just kind of participates in voting. So the secondaries operate, um, they're actually syn uh, asynchronously. So we have concerns about write. Um, so they, are, they, they can be a little behind the primary. So if, you're doing, if you are reading from the, uh, the secondaries, you kind of have to be aware that there might be some, some consistency issues there. Uh, replica sets are actually great for using them for not just the application itself. If you want to break off uh, secondaries for reporting or disaster recovery or backup, um, it's a great option. You could have secondaries in another data center for backup as well. And the automatic failover. So when the primary actually dies, there is an election that occurs between the two servers. That's not great color, but uh, eventually you end up with a new primary elected and the application picks up. Now, the, the Replica sets essentially contain the same set of data. So if you have all your application lives, all the data for your application would live in one replica set. But if you start to shard out, and this is how actually Mongo starts to shard to, uh, to, to horizontally scale, is a method called sharding. And they start to split the data out across multiple shards. Now each of these shards contains a replica set. So there's three, three uh, servers here. So we'd have a primary and two secondaries, a primary and two secondaries. Apparently, this is each of a replica set, but, we, but now we just have data, you know, one to three, three to six, eight to nine. So the data is now spread out across multiple servers. But the replica set still forms the basis of your uh, your infrastructure. So let's just do a quick demo. It's going to get a second. We can probably all see that. Make some more room here. So what I've got here is a small script that's going to fire up three instances. I'm going to untar the downloaded file, the three directories, and I'm going to start them up with the REPL set option, which actually starts up replica set, and I'm calling this one fit C. Uh, the DB path. By default, the DB path from earlier is slash data. Um, I'm actually going to specify it as being uh, the directory one, which I'm going to create above it. Uh, because I'm forking it, 
Um, it probably spits, if you don't fork, it dumps the console, so I won't actually have the data log to a log. So you have to start specifying things like log pass. So I'll have it go into the log. And the default ports are 27017. And because I'm starting up three instances on the same server, I'm going to run them on different ports. So 20, uh, 27017, uh, 18, and 19. That's pretty much what's needed to get. So if I just uh, run this guy, I should get three. Three processes running. And they're all on their reports, so 27017, 018, and 019. Uh, and there's my shell. Not a lot going on. But my REPL set is complaining. I actually haven't done anything. All I've said was when I started up is I actually just said this is a replica set, but I actually haven't actually created the replica set yet. I haven't initialized it. So he's uh, complaining right now in the log. Let's just clear this guy out. And I'm going to initiate the replica set. So in a few minutes. And this is what I'm referring to as far as the, uh, oh, there we go, so I'm on a primary. So yeah, I'm in the Mongo shell, and I'm using all of that for, for the administration. So that's kind of referring back to the beginning of the, the talk. So the shell is kind of used, um, you can use it programmatically, or you can use it for your, your administration. So now I've got a, a primary running, but that's not a lot of good, because now I've still got two replica sets that are still two numbers that aren't added to the replica set yet. So let's add those in. And I'm just going to add, and 27018, and run the status command, and I should see another member there sitting there. And they'll eventually become online, so it's doing an initial sync. So if there was data in the primary, and uh, the secondary, it's now syncing the data across to the, uh, to the secondary device, the secondary member. And we now have another member. So now it's sitting there as a secondary. So I'm not sure if anyone's kind of had to deal with clustering with MySQL and other and Oracle. This is it gets this is a very easy out of the box. And kind of give see an example of how easy this kind of run uh, run MongoDB. There's there's a, a little bit of gotcha. You know, it's very easy to kind of set this up. This could be very easy with three boxes, and you, now you have a replica set running. But you still have to worry about things like backing up and when things go wrong. But this kind of gives you just an idea of how kind of easy it is to kind of just download it and get things running. So, things like backing up. How do you back up? Uh, generally, always, always expect failure. Um, when you're complacent, things kind of, that's when things kind of go wrong. Uh, the business recovery, the business kind of dictates the, the backup methods. And you need to kind of take things into consideration like geography, uh, errors, production constraints, uh, capabilities. There is some obviously some overhead in running backups of, of MongoDB or with any database. Uh, replica sets work great. Um, if you kind of want to use the secondaries as backup sources, so again, use the, use the secondaries as the backup uh, target. Um, you can have secondaries run in different data centers, different uh, availability zones. Um, so you can kind of manage or separate out your kind of your, your admin functionality. Um, be aware of system errors. So you know sometimes backups don't get get corrupt. So make backups of backups. You have to worry about backup operations themselves requiring system resources. And there are ways to actually get this done. I'm running, kind of running out of time here. Um, there are ways. To, uh, there's two ways that guys do run backups. One is L snapshot levels at LVM. Uh, so you can run just um, System backups or snapshots, and you can run with well, Mongo dump and Mongo restore as well are options for, for running backups. So you can use LVM to create a snapshot of the database. Um, you need to worry about, I guess, journaling being on the same disk. And obviously, if you want to, you don't want to, you don't want to have your entire, you know, you got a 150 gig drive, and you've got your your data living in all this is one huge uh, volume. You don't want to snapshot that. You kind of want to think ahead of time and put your data in a separate uh, uh, volume. So you're only snapshotting the, the actual data itself. So some thought has to go into kind of planning ahead of time. 
Uh, but it's very easy, you, know, create, you create the snapshot, and then at that point you can actually just do a, a block level copy, uh, zip it up, and you're done. Or Mongo Dump and Mongo Restore um, are also great options for running uh, backups as well. Uh, I'm going to be here after the, the break, after the talk, so if any questions I can kind of um, take them up, but I'll be running out of time. So let me just touch on uh, when things go wrong, actually, and they will, uh, tools for, so know your database. Um, the profiler, and actually the one thing I want to make mention of here is the working set. Uh, I never mentioned that uh, Mongo likes RAM. Well, what you want to do is you want to get your entire working set in, in RAM. You don't want it touching disk. So there's some commands you can run that kind of give you an idea of what your working set is. And the working set is all the data that's being accessed. All the, kind of the, all the stuff that's kind of supporting the application is pulled up into memory and it's just there. And you want to keep as much of that in memory as you possibly can. Um, over seconds is the time between the first, I guess, insert and the, and the last time. So you want to kind of, you want a, a very long over seconds. Kind of give you an idea how, how often that uh, working set is refreshed. But uh, generally you want to keep your working set in memory. Uh, logging by default is not very verbose. So if you want to kind of, if you're kind of used to going, kind of going to your logs to see if there's any problems, uh, you won't see a lot of stuff there. You might, all you might see is actually is connection, connection made, connection made, which is their members talking to each other, which isn't very helpful if things aren't working properly. So there are ways to actually make the logging more verbose. Uh, the Mongo monitoring tool is very handy. Um, MongoDB provides a backup service and a monitoring service for, for MongoDB. Uh, so the monitoring is free. There's a cost of the backup. But it's very easy to get going. You can kind of just have a, a snapshot dashboard view of your backups. If anyone ever uses server density or those, those kind of tools or uh, New Relic, you kind of get a, a dashboard, a uh, nice view of what your database is actually doing. And the monitoring is free. I highly recommend the monitoring. But if you're going to go old school, you can run things like Mongo stats um, to kind of get an idea of what's going on. And then just your general OS tools. So network latency, disk throughput. Uh, it's kind of the whirlwind tour of MongoDB. Um, so if anyone kind of hits any hurdles or roadblocks or stumbling, uh, we have a meetup that tries to meet once a month. Um, sometimes it's every two months. And actually the next meetup uh, in April is being put on by uh, MongoDB. Uh, there's a Toronto day here in MongoDB, so it's at Bento Miso. So you can come to the meetup and lament about all your problems or rave about how great it is. Uh, but it's a good place to kind of meet up. And there's also a, a Google Plus group as well. It isn't as active as I'd like it to be, but again, there's ways to kind of reach out to the community if you've got any problems or questions, uh, if you're stuck. I highly recommend uh, education. Uh, there's free courses online at uh, MongoDB Inc. Uh, for admins and for developers. They have Java and they have a Node, uh, actually a Node uh, course as well. They're seven weeks and they're completely free. Uh, and they're a great way to kind of get to learn MongoDB. And that's the site there. So hopefully now we're all kind of Mongo rock gods. And uh, we're all kind of cool with, with using MongoDB in production. And uh, that's my presentation. Um, probably the only non-developer in the room here. Uh, so I'm, I can't talk from a developer perspective. Like actually the talk later on might touch more on kind of maybe why relational versus document-based. Um, the, certainly any, any time you have relational requirements, um, transaction requirements as well, um, if Mongo doesn't do transactions above the document level, um, it, it won't work. Um, but that, that said, there's no, you know, there's nothing, it's very common actually to run MongoDB in a hybrid environment. So things that are relational can be in a relational database and those that are not in, in, in 
in MongoDB. Uh, the example I kind of had as my first introduction to MongoDB was with the walmart.ca website. Um, that's where we ran MongoDB for that. And the site that was the requirements was kind of the items kept changing constantly. So they couldn't nail down a schema for the items. Every day the product changed. So they actually built the navigational site, the user interface, the login, all that stuff, the CMS was all built in MySQL. All that lived in the Mongo database was the items themselves. So you can kind of take things where they fit best. Um, over time, I think people have kind of changed how they, they look at it. When we first kind of got into Mongo, it was probably about an 80-20 split, 80 being relational, 20 being Mongo for an application, so in a hybrid environment. And now lots I find people kind of start MongoDB entirely. And then where the kind of relational makes sense, they start to bring, bring that in. But it, it used to be kind of the, the inverse of that. It would start relational and go, okay, maybe it makes sense to put items in or documents in Mongo. Um, so the long answer, I guess, is it depends. Um, and the application kind of dictates that. Yeah. Um, we're going to break for lunch.